Good morning. I want to read uh, a passage to you from James chapter 5 and verse uh, 16, if you'll follow along with me there. James chapter 5 and verse 16, where James says the following to us. He says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I want to say to you that there is great power in that... uh, simple admonition that James gives us in James chapter 5 and verse 16, where he talks to us about the power of confession. And, and I want you to notice that the, the audience for the confession here is, is one another. There, there is obviously a place first and foremost for our confessing our sins to God. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read, I, I, I thought about reading this morning, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. In, in Psalm 32, the psalmist talks about the blessing of confessing our sins to God and about the blessing that we experience when God takes away our, 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 our sin. Uh, and, and sin, first and foremost, is between us and God. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the part of sin that is so tragic, is that sin causes a breach in my relationship with God. And, and that is then that is fundamentally the thing that needs to be repaired when I find myself in sin, is I've, I've got to correct that. And that's the blessing of what Jesus has done for us, is He makes reparation possible. It makes it possible for me to be rescued, to be redeemed, for me to be released from captivity or imprisonment to my sin, because Jesus has made forgiveness uh, possible. But, but in order to find that forgiveness, I've got to acknowledge my wrong. I mean, I've, I've got to admit before God that this is what I did. This is, this is my sin. And I, and, I, and I forgive me. Forgive me of that. And Psalm 32 is a great passage that talks about the blessing of that forgiveness that we find with God. I, I want you to see in James 5 and verse 16... It's connected to the idea of, of our confessing our sin to God. But, but, but James here is talking about the power of our confessing our sin to each other. In the sense that we, we find help and we find healing with one another in overcoming our sin. And, and I, want to, I want to talk about confession to one another in two respects this morning. I want to talk about it with respect to our repairing relationships with with each other when they're broken. When there is a a chasm between me and you, when I have done you wrong, it is so important that that I repair that. It is important that I acknowledge the wrong that's been, uh, that's been a part of that. But, but the, but the, the second thing that's a part of confessing our sins to one another is that we can find help and we can find healing with one another in overcoming those sins in our life that are insidious, those things that keep us trapped, those things that keep us imprisoned when we're trying to reform things in our character that need need changing. There's, I I suppose, a third aspect of confession that that deserves some amplification, and that is the fact that, 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 that sometimes... The wrongs that I've done are not just between me and one person, but they're wrongs wrongs that affect the reputation of the group. When when I'm engaged in, when I've been engaged in some kind of sin that that has become become known uh, so that that it hurts your reputation and hurts the reputation of Jesus in the community, then then the reparation is bigger than just between me and and an individual. It's it's it's, It's something that needs fixing between me and you, I mean, in, in the collective sense, that, that, that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the wrong so that there can be a, a repairing of that relationship so that I can say to you, I did this, and everyone knows that I did this, and, and that is not who I want to be, and I'm going to be different. And, and so confession to one another is, is, is needful and is powerful in those three ways. When I need to fix something between me and one other person, when I have some kind of insidious sin that I need some help in overcoming, and when there's some kind of public repair that needs to be made or amends that needs to be confessed because I've hurt the reputation of the Lord's, of the Lord's people. I, I want to say some things this morning about the power of confession, and then I want to say some things quickly about rules for confessing. 
The first thing I want to say to you with regard to the power of confession is this is what makes confession to one another powerful. When, when, I, when I confess my sin, I surrender a battle that I can't win for a victory that's guaranteed. I surrender a battle I can't win for a victory that's guaranteed. Have you ever been caught in the trap of justifying something that's not justifiable? I, I, you're confronted with a wrong and you keep like trying to make it right. Not, not by confessing it, but by making a cover story for it. And so you say, well, you know, this was the reason for it. It was, it was this. Or that, um, th- 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 well, there was a mitigating circumstance and it was this. Or it's, it's, really not, it's really not what it seems when it is what it seems. But I just don't want to say that it is what it seems. Um, we, were, we went down to the beach this uh, summer and built some sandcastles with uh, some friends of ours and their kids. And um, I was thinking, as I was thinking about confession and about the things that we do in our life when we cover our sin and about how that's like building sandcastles. Um, what happens to sandcastles? I mean, they, they fall down, don't they? It's inevitable. You, uh, and and we, I had this huge sandcastle that I was building with the kids and... Uh, and it doesn't matter how much sand you pile up. And, and I, I wanted it right next to, you know, I wanted it right next to the water so that it, the, the water would come and fill up the moat around it. But as sure as you do that, the, the water undercuts the sides and, and it starts to cave in. It doesn't matter how hard you pack the sand. And it doesn't matter how many buckets you put there. It doesn't matter how deep you dig the moat. All of the effort in trying to keep the sandcastle out, is, it's all futile. The sandcastle is going to fall. You can build sandcastles, and sandcastles are fun to build, but you can't live in them. You can't live in a sandcastle. A sandcastle is no castle at all. It, doesn't, it can't protect anything. A sandcastle is just a fiction. And when I find myself in sin and defending my sin or, and, and trying, to, trying to fight against against repairing it, trying to fight against making amends. It's like building a sandcastle. I mean, you, you, you add another bucket and you pack it a little harder and you de- dig the moat a little deeper, but, but it, it just keeps caving in. It's a losing battle. Saul of Tarsus found that as he, Jesus talked about him kicking against the goads. It, it, it's, you're not winning. You're losing, Saul. Give up. Surrender. Now, the blessing of confession is that when I acknowledge my sin to God or when I acknowledge my sin to you, then it is a victory that's guaranteed. Name one person, one person in the Scripture who asked God sincerely for forgiveness and who was denied it. Can you name one? I mean, just one person who asked God, even King Manasseh. There's a prayer. He was wicked. And, and, but he asked God for forgiveness and God forgave him. Even King Ahab. And, and Elijah said, don't forgive him, God. And God forgave. He forgave Ahab. God said, can you see Ahab? Do you see how his, his heart is broken and it's disheveled? It's, it's, a, it's a guaranteed victory that when I acknowledge my wrong before God, He takes it away. He takes it away. When I, when I let the light in on the things that are wrong in me, when I, when I let that light in and it exposes the wrong and I confess my wrong before God, it is a guaranteed victory. But it is a losing battle when I fight against when I fight against the change, the, the good change that I need to make in my life. Number two, here's a second power in confession, is it gives up a hollowness that's never filled for a fullness that can't be vanquished. It gives up a hollowness that's never filled for a fullness that can't be vanquished. If we were to go to Psalm 32 and read 
David there talks about that how when he kept his sin inside, it rotted his bones. He just, he, he was, he, he had a hunger and he had a thirst that can never be filled. He was a hollow man. And he just kept, kept getting hollower, ho, hollower and hollower all the time as he held things in. But when he confessed his wrong, that then he found the blessedness of forgiveness. And, and, and that's when I have kept secrets. And I, I, I want to I wanna beg our young people, don't start, don't start in your youth keeping secrets. The biggest, the biggest mistake that I made when I was in junior high school was to learn to tell lies to get away with things. And the most miserable part of my youth was having, a, 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 was having two faces. With having a reputation with a respectable reputation with one group and having an ill reputation with someone else. And with doing all of the kind of charade that's necessary to kind of keep those, to keep those two fronts going. It's a, it's a miserable life. The life of, of hiding things. It is a hollow life. But I want to say to you, there is nothing that's more fulfilling. There is nothing that's more, full, more filling than to experience grace. Because it's not owed you. But when you ask God and when God forgives, or when you, when you repent, when you acknowledge your sin to others, and they, and they give you forgiveness, then, then there is nothing, there's nothing that's more filling and more motivating than to have experienced the grace of God in your life. Because of God's grace, they're just, it, it takes away so much fear in my life. I just don't worry about tomorrow. And the reason I don't worry about tomorrow is because God has been so good to me when I was a sinner. The reason I don't worry about what's going to happen or about, about what someone might think or about, about some tragedy that might occur is because I've been, I've been a bad man. I, I've been a sorry person. And God saved me. And whatever bad thing might happen to me, I deserve that and I deserve worse. But if God has been so gracious to me to forgive my sin, then I've got nothing to be scared of. Nothing. And that is such a comfort to me, to not be afraid. Because there is nothing more filling than grace. And I would that every believer would know the confidence that comes from being forgiven. And knowing that once we're forgiven, there's not anything. There's not anything that Satan can bring against us. When you have your integrity, when things are right between you and God, there's nothing to be afraid of, Christian. Nothing is so liberating. And so one of the powers of confession is that it gives up a hollowness that's never filled for a fullness that can't be vanquished. Number three, confession gives up a loneliness that keeps you stuck and sick for a brotherhood that helps you grow and heal. Confession gives up a loneliness that keeps you stuck and keeps you sick for a brotherhood that helps you grow and heal. Look at verse, um, look again at verse 16 of the text and how this reads of James 5. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I actually had not noticed that he says heal there until we were studying the book of James, the, the letter of James in our, in our, in our letters from heaven class. I had not, I not appreciated the power of the word heal there. And that's part of the point of confession here to each other is that I find when I acknowledge my sin to you and when I acknowledge my sin to others, when I let others in, with others in on my sin problem, that I can find power that I don't have when I'm trying to fight something by myself. Uh, 
when I am wrestling alone with my sin, I am so vulnerable. Especially when Satan has beaten me at something over and over and over again. As long as he can keep me alone, he, he, he keeps winning. But when I shine the light on the fact that Satan is beating me in this area of my life, and I need help, God can bring resources into my life that can rescue me. He can bring counsel. He can bring sympathy. He can bring accountability. And without those things, I stay stuck and I stay sick. But do you see when I invite your accountability in my life, when I, when I say to you, I'm having trouble with this, and you can ask me about that, that helps me. And when I say to you, I'm wrestling with this, I, I, I don't know what to do about this, and, and you've had a, a similar experience, or you have something, maybe that's not an issue for you at all, and so you have some wisdom that you can give to me in that regard. Do you, do you see that's part of the Lord's healing? He can give me counsel through you and he can, he can give me accountability through, through, through you. And he can bring me the power of collective prayer about that. Because you can pray for my healing and trust that God will provide an answer to that. The power of confession is it gives up that loneliness that keeps me stuck and that keeps me sick for a brotherhood that helps me grow and heal. Number four, the power of confession is it gives up a lid that will always be limiting for me for an influence that God redeems and magnifies. Um, when, there is, when there is something in my life that needs acknowledgement and I, I won't face it, I, I, ju I just want you to see how that how that becomes a, a sticking place for me. I, I mean, it keeps me stuck. It keeps me, it keeps me trapped. It becomes, it becomes a lid for me. And, and, and say, I want, I want to come talk to you about something, but there is, this, there is this beam in my eye. And so I come and I, and I talk to you and, 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 and I nearly knock you over with the beam that's poking out of my eye. How credible am I going to be when I talk to you? Uh, or I come and I ask for help. And the thing that I ask for help for is a small thing. But you see there's this bigger thing that I really need help. How awkward is that conversation going to be? When you need to get, kind of get over this thing that's a small thing and get to the thing that's the real problem, that's the real, that's the real root. King Saul in the, Old, in the Old Testament could never, could never acknowledge the things that were wrong with him as a leader. He couldn't acknowledge the fact that he was jealous of David. He couldn't acknowledge that he did the wrong thing when he offered a sacrifice without Samuel being there. He couldn't acknowledge that he did the wrong thing when he when he, when he kept the spoils of war rather than offering them all as a sacrifice to God. He, he, he kept doing things to cover his wrongs and to try to make others accomplices, to make Jonathan an accomplice with him, to, to, make, to, to make Samuel, the priest, an accomplice with him. He, he always wanted other leadership to prop him up and to make him look good. But there were holes in who he was. And he couldn't acknowledge that. And it, it, it meant that he kept falling and falling and falling and falling and falling further as a leader until it became fatal. When I have things in my character that I don't work on, that I fix, that I, I, I just decide I'm going to change this in my life, but I'm not going to change... The, I'm not going to admit this. That, that becomes a lid... That continues, to, that continues to limit me. But when I acknowledge my sin, the way David talks about in Psalm 32, and when I acknowledge my sin to you, 
then that puts my reputation in God's hands. And God is in the habit of taking sullen, sultry, uh, that's the wrong word, uh, taking foul reputations, broken reputations, and redeeming them. God can take a prostitute named Rahab, and he can make her a hero of faith. God can take a liar like Abraham, and he can make him the father of the faithful. God can take an adulterer like David, and he can make him a man after God's own heart. God can, and it is, it, the biblical history is rep, replete with these kinds of stories. God takes broken people. God takes sinful people. God takes people who deserve to die, and He makes them. He makes them men we can follow. He makes them people that we look up to. He, he fills the, the lineage of Jesus with people who are worthless. And when I acknowledge my sin, I put, my, I put my, my fortune and my future in God's hands and He can redeem my influence. He can take me when I'm a sinner, when I'm worthless, when I'm no good. And He can make me His messenger. He can make me His servant. He can make me His helper. He can make me His minister. He will, he will make me His fellow worker in His kingdom. He will do all of that with me. When I give up a lid that will always be limiting for an influence that God can redeem and can magnify. Let me say four things very quickly. These are rules. Hang with me, okay? This, is, this will be quick. Four rules for confessing. Number one, dig up the roots. Dig up the roots. And what I mean by that is that when you confess your wrongs, when I come and I say to Jennifer, I'm sorry for... Say the thing that you're, that, you, that you're really sorry for. Not something less than that. When, 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 you, when you're going to acknowledge a problem, I mean, get it all out. Don't, don't chop it off at the top of the ground. We, we used to have Johnson grass that grew in our garden when I was, when I was a kid. And, and you, it, you know what happens if you, if, you just, if you pull on Johnson grass? It breaks off at the top of the ground. I mean, you've got to get a shovel. You, you got to get a mattock and you got you to gotta dig down and get the root out. Otherwise, you're, it's going to come back. It will come back and it will come back. It will it'll keep growing underground and it'll come back bigger and thicker. And so, I mean, you got you to gotta dig out the roots and you got to grind the stumps. I mean, you got to get rid of the stuff. And so dig up the roots. If you're going to confess it, do it right and, and dig up the roots. Number two. No exhibitionism. No exhibitionism. And this is what I mean by that. Sometimes confessing to everyone is not appropriate. I don't need to... And I can turn confession into something where it's just, a, where it's just like streaking. And that is inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Where I just, I just bear my soul and... It, and it, and when I, when, I do it, when I do it in a way that's not appropriate, I don't find the help that I need with that. Sometimes the best confession is, be, is with one other person. Sometimes the best confession is with a small group of persons. Sometimes it's, with, sometimes it's with just someone who can give you the counsel or the accountability that you need. And it's not appropriate for everybody. The, the, the fulfillment of James 5.16 is not just all of us parading to the front and just pouring out our, our sin to each other. He says, confess your faults to one another. That, that, that is a, that's a reciprocal action. And sometimes it's appropriate to, to, to say that to the group. Sometimes it's inappropriate. But, 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 but don't, don't use it as, a, as an occasion for, for just exhibiting your sin or your sorrow. It it's, needs to be for healing. And so consider the kind of confession that's appropriate for the healing that you need. So that you have accountability and so that you have light and so that you're not alone in that. So that you have coaching and so you have, uh, you, you, you have um, counsel. Number three, stop sniping specs. Stop sniping specs. This is what I mean. Um, when it comes to looking at my sin and when it comes to, to, to looking at the changes that I need to make, I can become hyper-aware of what's wrong with everyone else. 
And, and so I, I think about my sin, but then I, it makes me, when I think about my sin, it makes me want to think about John's sin. And John's got this spot in his eye. And, and if he could just let me get my finger in there, I think I could get it out for him. It makes me hyper-focused on Jeff's sin. And so I want to take Jeff aside and I want to help him. I want to put my glasses on or get a magnifying glass. And I want to help him get the speck that's out of his eye. And this is what I mean by sniping specks. I mean, when I, when, I, when, I am, when I have sin in my life, it makes me want to start pointing the gun at other people and, like, and, 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 and pulling the trigger at the specks that are in their eyes rather than dealing with my sin. This happens in marriages. I mean, I've got, I've, got, I've got my stuff that I need to fix, but that can make me hyper-focused on all the things that are wrong with Jennifer. So I want, I want her to fix her stuff too. Listen, fix your stuff. Fix my stuff. If I want to help Jennifer, if I want to help you, if I want to help anyone with the specks in their eyes, I got to get the log out of mine. Because you will not listen to me when I got a log in my eye. And I can't get close enough to help you with the speck because I'm going to poke my beam in my eye through your head when I try to do that. I mean, I'm going to knock you over with it and you won't listen to me. And so you got you to you deal with your stuff if you're going to help other people with their stuff. And if you ain't dealing with your stuff, people aren't going to let you help them with theirs. And so confession is so important so that we're not just poking at other people's specks. We got to deal with our stuff. And number four... And, and this, is a, this is such a, it's such a common mistake with confession. It's so important to say this. Listen very carefully. Forgiveness, remember this, forgiveness is a gift. It's not an entitlement. Forgiveness is a gift. It's not an entitlement. This is what I mean by that. When I come and I confess my sin to you, when I say to you, I did this and I'm sorry, you don't have to forgive me. Now, th this, is, this is what I mean by that. I mean, God, God, wants other people, God wants me to forgive others, and He wants you to forgive the people that sin against you. But what I'm saying is, as far as I'm concerned, I don't deserve your forgiveness. With you forgive me, it's a gift that you give me. It's not something that I'm entitled to. And I, and I want to say that this often goes wrong when we ask other people for forgiveness. We say, I, I'm sorry. And so now I've put the burden on you. You, you, you need to forgive me. And you need, to, you, need to, uh, you need, to, you need to, to give me all the liberties that I had before. I mean, trust needs to be completely restored to me because I asked you for forgiveness, right? I mean, I, 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 did, I said what I was supposed to say. You're supposed to forgive me. When, when, when that is my attitude about forgiveness, I don't get it. I mean, I, I haven't really understand, understood the seriousness of my sin. Forgiveness is a gift. It's not an entitlement. And when I ask other people for forgiveness, I need to, I, the, to have the right attitude. I need to have low expectations. And this is what I mean. Whatever, however people treat me, when I've wronged them and when I've asked for forgiveness, however people choose to treat me, because that's their choice, however they choose to treat me, I need to treat it as grace from God. And so if they want to rebuke me, then I need to learn to love it because I need to be rebuked. And if they want to hold that against me, then I need to confess like David did in Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. And rejoice in the fact that God has left in my life some people who remind me of what I did so that I don't return to that life anymore. And if people say, well, you're going to have to do this before I can trust you again, then, then embrace that because that's accountability. I need to have to earn their trust again. And if I feel like people whisper about me and about my sin, then so be it, so be it. See that as part of God's grace. Now, I have found, what I've experienced is when I have low expectations, when I ask for forgiveness, that what I receive from people is grace in abundance. 
that every rebuke and every reprimand and every reminder is something that blesses me and that helps me and that humbles me. But I have never, I, I have only experienced in my life, and I mean this universally, I have only experienced in my life that the people of God have treated me far, far better than I deserve. Far better than I deserve. You have been nothing but gracious to me. And not only have the people here been nothing but gracious to me, I mean God's people everywhere have never been anything but gracious to me. And I don't deserve that. But if I have a chip on my shoulder about being forgiven, and I don't think that you for, you've forgiven me in the way that I deserve, or, or I, I, I feel like you, know, you, haven't, you haven't completely released me, when I, when I walk around with that kind of notion about forgiveness, then... then then I stay, I stay stuck in, this, in, in, a, in a place of bitterness rather than experiencing the real gratitude and grace that comes when we, just, when we embrace whatever comes our way as being a, the gift of God. Because forgiveness is not something that I'm entitled to. It's something that's given as a gift. And I need to honor it as a gift. And then I'll find the real blessing in it. Uh, this is not the lesson I intended to preach today. I was going to do a lesson on, on things that I'm grateful for about this church. And one of the things that I... The first thing that I wrote down is that I could appreciate the fact that this is a confessing church. The, the lesson this morning is not because I think we have a problem with confessing. I think we can always do better about that. And it's not because I'm, I'm wanting to start like a, a, a trek of people that come to the front. And I mean, if you, if, you need, if you need help, then come. I, I, but I, I appreciate the fact that we acknowledge our sin to each other. And that we acknowledge our flaws to each other. And there is, that there's that kind of spirit in this group. And I, I want to encourage that to be the same. And for it to be more the case. And if you're in a place this morning where the devil has got you stuck, where he's got you sick because of some insidious sin in your life, something that is just beating you all the time, or if there's something that needs to be repaired between you and another, I just want to recommend to you the power of confession a tool that God has given us so that we can be free, liberated before Him, and restored and reconciled in our relationships with each other. So that's the reason for the message this morning. Do you have a need this morning to confess? Then why not come as we stand and as we sing?